All right, so I sent this out to everybody. Um, I think it was like Wednesday last week. Honey, I think you turned your video on. I don't mind. Um, but if you guys didn't have a chance to go over it, we're going to go over it right now as a group. This is just kind of a refresher. Um, some of this stuff I wouldn't have known. I wouldn't have remembered either um, without having like, you know, looked at my notes and everything. So it's just a refresh on what we've learned this semester, some of it. And then on, on Thursday, we're going to do the quiz where we go a little bit more in depth to different questions and things that aren't as visual. But for this, um, anybody who wants to guess or has the answer, go ahead and answer as we go. The first thing we're talking about is what we learned at the beginning of the semester, which has to do with production design with this color, color harmonies, um, and naming the different color harmonies that there are, starting with the one top left, number one. Does anybody know the name of that color harmony? Compliment. Complimentary, yes. Yes, complimentary. And I think the one, uh, there, there, there's another one that's, uh, oh man, what's the other complimentary? It's um, split complimentary. Yep, you're Is right. That that's the one two? right next to it. Mm -hmm. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> so complimentary, <laughs> if you guys don't remember, it's on the color wheel. If we're looking at it, you can see it. Analogous. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut in. Hey, um, analogous, um, number three. Analogous, yes. Analogous, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's it. <laughs> I think that's how it's spelled. I think it's an A, I guess. All right, um, but with complementary in the top left, it just means that on the color wheel, you are picking two colors that are opposite of each other. So the purple and the yellow, there's also red and green. Um, there's blue and orange, or like a darker blue and a, like a yellowy orange. All, just basically picking a color from one side and picking the opposite color on the other side means it's a complementary color. And it means that it's supposed to complement each other and it's supposed to look good based on mm -hmm. just studies and what they've seen. It's a theory, so it might not always work, but that is the theory that it's going to look good if you pick opposite colors. Then like, like uh, Gabe said, the next one over is split complementary. What that is, is taking a color from any part of the color wheel and instead of taking the color directly opposite of it, like which would be purple in this case, you split the other side and take from either side. So you take from, instead of taking from purple, you're taking from the darker blue and you're taking from that more maroony red. And so you do all three of those colors in that instance. And the next one he said is uh, analogous or I believe that's how it's pronounced. And that is taking something from the color wheel and then taking two colors on either side of it so that they're all next to each other. That could be the dark, that could be all three of those bluish colors. It could be all three of the reds. It could be a mixture of like the purple with the red and the blue and mixing those and having that be your color palette or your main colors in your scene. All right, so number four, does anyone know what that one's called? Not a gradient. What was that? A gradient. No, it's actually called monochromatic, but it basically is with uh, the gradient. What it is is you're just taking the one color hue, and you're taking different um, shades or different um, what is it called? Like different brightness levels and stuff like that from that same hue, and so it's getting brighter and it's looking lighter. And you're taking it darker and it's getting darker, but it's all from the same hue. So it's all yellow. But as we go and add more black to it, it starts to look more gold. As we add more white to it, it starts to look more like a milky yellow. So monochromatic. Spell it right. It's chromatic. All right, does anybody know what the next one's called? It's kind of like a triangle. Triadic. Triadic is taking the color and basically making a triangle on the color wheel and taking the colors that line up with wherever that triangle lands. So you're taking equal part, 
equal um, color hues away from whatever color you choose. So from the red, three colors away is yellow and three colors away on the opposite side is blue. And also between the blue and the yellow, there's three colors. So then you can do that with any of the colors in there. If you take purple, you just do three colors over, it's gonna be green. And then you do three colors over again, it's gonna be that orange. So it would be purple, green, and orange, or it can be red, blue, and yellow, which is used a lot for like superheroes and stuff like that. Films don't use it as often, but it is, um, it is still used and supposedly looks good together. Not spelling right. All right, next one. Does anyone know what that one's called? Starts to get more and more sounding like math as we go on. <laughs> so this square, this little rectangle one is tetradic. Oh no. So that is taking two, it's basically taking two sets of complementary colors. So you see it's like these ones on the opposite side and then these ones are on the opposite side and making a rectangle out of that. So you're taking a set and then you're doing like, you're going two colors over and taking that color and then taking its opposite, its complementary color, putting those together and having four different colors for your, for your scene makes it a tetradic color harmony. This one, I'm gonna go ahead and tell you guys what it is. It's quadratic circle. I mean, it's quadratic square. It's the uh, basically the same thing as tetradic. You're taking two complementary colors. You're just spacing it out more. Now you're going two colors for every color you choose. And so wherever you're choosing um, your colors from on that color wheel, you go two over, pick the next one, go two over and pick the next one. And what, it, what it's doing is just selecting two complementary colors still. It's just not gonna look like a triangle when you map it out, it's gonna look like a square. Does anyone know why that's important to know? It's important to know color harmonies because for a scene to look good, these are the colors that you can put together that have proven to complement each other or look well on screen or look well in a painting or on a picture. So you don't want to just take any color you can and throw it in there and see what looks good. You want to actually go into a color wheel and figure out what your color palette will be or what your main color will be and then sort of build off from there and branch off to what, what you might be able to do that will look very good based on these color theories that have proven to be having a good track record in, in the past. Doesn't mean you can't select colors from like all over the color wheel, but it's just, uh, that's not really proven to, to work very well. Also, of course, it's gonna depend on how, how bright you make it, how dark you make it, how warm or how cool the color looks, which will affect how, the mood that it's taken. Um, and so there's many different variations. Even if you just take this purple and yellow, it could be this bright banana yellow. It could be a very sickly um, whitish yellow or greenish yellow. Um, and it could be that purple. Again, it could be very light purple or it could be very dark purple, looking very fancy or um, very mild, it could just be different things to make it come off with a different emotion and have a different just very poppy. poppy, yeah. To have a different like composition and have a different look when you blend those colors together in your scene. And then the, the production designer should follow that. The director and the production designer should come up with a color palette, color scheme, and know what color harmony they kind of want to use so that they can follow that for the movie as well as each individual scene, depending on if a scene needs to be very drastically different feeling. One way you can do that is by using color to set it apart. Movies have done that for setting apart different time, um, different dates. If it's from like one scene's in the past and one scene's in the future or different one scene's in the present, different perspectives. Different worlds. Um, yeah, different worlds, different locations or just different 
different um, feelings as well. Yeah, different feelings that somebody might be feeling happy and they're going to have these very different color scheme than somebody who's feeling kind of sad. They might have the same color scheme and they might just have it darker. Like I said, they might just have a, a darker yellow. They might have a darker purple and it still be those, those yellow and purple. So it's still complementary, but it's darker so that it's a little bit more moodier. But yeah, so it's important. It's just important for color is extremely important when you're thinking about film because it's a visual media and it's like a painting if you spend the time to make it that way. What's that, Vic? It's interesting that uh, white color is not here at all. Yeah, because white isn't really, I mean, it's like a mixture of all colors. So it's not really. But you, you, could still, the, sorry, you, could still use, you could still use it for a contrast, right? Yeah. So I think white and black kind of, it's just um, on this color wheel, if we, were, if we were to add brightness completely to any of these, it's going to look completely white, no matter which part of the color wheel we pick from. As it's same as if we go all the way to the bottom okay. in the middle. Okay. What? Same, it, same as if we go all the way to the middle, it's going to look completely black no matter which part of the color wheel we're picking it from. Now, if we take even a tiny inch and a step out of that, you can see like in this uh, bottom, bottom right one, it is a very bright colors, but they still obviously are very different. So if we just add more and more white to that color, um, eventually it's just going to be pure white. But if we take even like one step back, it's going to look a tiny bit like whatever color we are at. Same thing with black. If we go all the way in the middle, it's going to be completely black, no matter which color we initially start with. But as we take one or two steps forward and keep going with more color, it's going to start changing that black, even if it's just a tiny bit. If you put like a black that has a tiny hint of blue next to a black that has a tiny hint of yellow, you're gonna see a difference, even if you can't see it with the naked eye, just looking at one or the other. If you put them next to each other, you start to see it. Um, but that is why white and black kind of work with most colors it's because they actually are a part of those color harmonies. They're a part of those color hues. It's just adding so much white that it no longer looks like that color or taking away so much of that, that light that it looks like black. Does anybody remember what a recoupment waterfall or otherwise known as a payment waterfall is when we're talking about distribution? Um, it, it, it starts from the, the first people who, who recoup from the, from the movie, from the sales of the movie, which mm -hmm. is usually, uh, the production, uh, the the production. No, they're the last ones no. in the water. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm going. Yeah, the production is the last <laughs> ones to get the money. <laughs> okay, I'm going. <laughs> you're good. No, so that then you were right. Um, you're yeah, right. It, it is mm -hmm. a. It ha is how people recoup the money. It's how the money is distributed for the film. Um, and so, if you look at the graph, you can see like from the actual sales from theaters or from non-theaters, which could be like um, video on demand or something like that, home entertainment, DVDs and Blu-rays, television, oh, video on demand's over here. I'm not really sure what non-theatrical would be, but other would be like merchandise and stuff like that. You're they all get their cut. Saying. If you're selling from a theater, the theater's taking its cut before it sends the money down the, the waterfall. And then it's going to, if you have a distributor, then the distributor is going to take their fee, their, dis their distribution fee, and they're going to recoup their costs that they put in for the trailer and the poster and all of that stuff if they were the ones to um, pay for that, pay to make those things. Um, and then it, well, it also, it's like they get gross and they recoup their costs and then they 
have their net income, which they recoup, then recoup their fees. And then they pass whatever's left down the line. If you have a sales agent, they do the same thing. Um, they're going to take out any costs that they have, any expenses that they have incurred to um, get the film to distributors or to do any deals. They could have been helping with some kind of marketing or something like that. So they're going to recoup their costs and then they're going to take out their fee and then they're going to pass it down to the producers. And then the producers are going to use that money to repay the budget. And after the budget is repaid, it's going to go finally to net profits. And net profits, that might get distributed between um, investors and producers and different crew and, and cast if they were big enough to want net profit uh, percentages. And so yeah, a recruitment waterfall is just how the money flows down as you go step by step through the different middle middlemen to get to the final um, production or the producers. Does anyone have anything to add to that? I think, like I said, um, now I suppose streaming would fall under non-theatrical. Streaming would be video on demand still. Would it be? Yeah, it'd be uh, subscribe. Well, it depends on what streaming you're doing, but AVOD, TVOD, or SVOD. If it's a streaming service, it'd be SVOD then. If it's like Netflix, it's a subscription based video on demand. Oh, okay. So that's why I was like, I don't know what, I don't exactly know what non theatrical is. Maybe that's like plays and stuff. That makes sense. Mm. But I don't really know. I don't, I guess that goes along with that. But yeah, it's just like how the money flows down to the to the producers. And this is why independent films make it's hard to make money because uh, especially with first films, people don't really know what they're doing. They don't know what a good deal is. And they end up letting the distributor pay too much for expenses to do the, the trailer, to do the poster and, and different marketing. And so when it gets to you might have like, you know, a few million dollars in sales at the theater, but once it gets to the distributor, well, they have a million dollars, $2 million in fees that they paid um, to create all that stuff for the marketing material. So they're going to recoup all that and then they're going to take their fee out. And then you might've had a sales agent, same thing. You might not have made a very good deal with them. They might have taken a bigger percentage than you were thinking. Um, and then they take out their fee. And by the time it gets to you and you pay down the budget, you might not even be able to pay down your budget. So it's just like, really have to check out those uh, contracts whenever you're doing different deals like that. And we talked a lot about that this semester. So like, I think it was like 15 to 35% for distributors. Mm -hmm. International, it's like 50%. Um, sales agents, they do, I think 15 to 25%. I think we had a graph showing but, exactly, uh, the exact percentages. Yeah, and that's good. That's earlier in the semester. I can relook at my notes later, but just remember, like, just because a movie makes a lot of money at the box office, it doesn't mean that the person who made the movie is very rich. It still has a lot of people to go through before the money finally falls to them, um, and they might not have made anything at all. All right, does anybody remember in television what the, the hierarchy is in the writer's room? There's quite a few different titles that um, the hierarchy is, goes through for different decisions and people to finalize the scripts and say like, yes, I like that one. Does anybody remember what the first person is that makes all the decisions in the writing room? Showrunner. Showrunner, yes. The showrunner, um, usually they are credited as the executive producer. You can have um, a few of them. Actually, that leads into the second one. So if you have more than one executive producer, 
they would be the co-executive producers. I'll just write that out. If I can. Co-executive producers. And so one person is going to be the showrunner. They're going to be the main person who um, has to finalize every decision. And then you have the co-executive producers that have a, a lot of power and are almost at the level, but aren't exactly the showrunner. So the showrunner is not really a credit that's usually given in the actual credits of the show. Um, it's just kind of a given title on the set. So everybody knows who's running who's running the show. But yeah, so below co-executive producers, we have the next title. Does anybody remember what it would be? Priscilla? <laughs> what? I'm just kidding. I don't think you'd remember. Um, so it'd be the showrunner, the executive producer, and then the not line producer, right? It would be a different producer. Yeah, it'd be a it's it is a producer. Yeah, but it's a different producer. It's the executive producer and the um put me on the spot now i'm nervous i know <laughs> it's the uh, supervising producer Yay. supervising producer because they are going to supervise obviously hey, the next oh, yeah. title uh, supervising if they are supervising producers who are they supervising the next title is anybody you know <laughs> The actors? No. Okay. So this is the writers' room. So yes. the actors really aren't in here. Oh, that was a bad guess. Like, like the writing supervisor, like the writing lead or writing supervisor for the team. Sort of. I mean, like they are, they are, they are part of the writing team. So they are over um, some of the writing decisions that this other this other title does. I'll just give it out. So <laughs> uh, it's producers. So producers are underneath the supervising producer. Supervising producer will look over the producers and make sure the producers are doing what they're supposed to. Yeah. To be fair, from what I've seen, like with the research we did, there's a lot of positions underneath another position, underneath another position. Yeah. So, I feel like unless you're actually working day-to-day -day with it it's kind of hard to remember all of the functions oh yeah like i said i wouldn't really remember this if i wasn't checking my stuff um not this one anyway i would remember some of the other ones but this one i would definitely i'd remember like showrunner producers supervising producers um and a few others that we'll get into but i wouldn't remember every single step because there's a lot and the bigger you get the bigger the show is the more people in the writing room the more of these titles need to be had so people know well, who's my direct boss and who's the boss above them and who's the boss that I need to go to if, you know, I have the final script and I need to get final approval, obviously, you know, the showrunner. So, um, but yeah, so they have producers and then you have co-producers, which is basically like a co-executive producer to the executive producer. The producers are a little bit um, they're either right on par with each other, with the co-producers, or the co-producers are just right underneath them with some kind of tasks of like what they actually do. Maybe the producers do one more thing than them or something like that. So co-producers is next. Um, underneath that, you actually have the people that um, are writing like the outlines and stuff like that and like adjusting them. Does anyone remember what that title is? The next step. So this, this next step is actually the writer that they will, I believe this is the one that they will always get at least one episode a season to be able to write. Oh, you're talking about the, um, the thing where they get outside writers? No, this is a step in the writer's room where they, they always get assigned at least one episode. Steps underneath them do not. So they're called, this, this title is story editor. They're called that because they're going to take what the people oh. underneath them have done and edit it and make it into a viable episode, filling it in, whatever needs to be filled in, changing whatever needs to be changed. 
um, and then bringing it to the next step up to see, you know, if that's a good story or if they need to make adjustments. <laughs> yeah, like I said, the titles are hard to remember and I understand. <laughs> All right, yeah. so this next step underneath, uh, underneath, like underneath it. For people to know that I suck at terms, but I actually know the stuff for the most part. So these next people underneath it, they're the ones who write out the outline of the show. It's kind of like a step-by-step -step of what's going to happen in these moments that they were talking about in the product, in the writer's room as a whole. Um, they even remember what they're called. They're the main, I would say they're like the main initial entry point into actual writing. I'm the head writers? I'm like. The head writers. <laughs> I, like I said, I suck at terms. No, I know. I, I Like, I understand. Like, these are, like, I wouldn't, like, titles are hard. Would it have anything with, like, like the storyboard or anything? What, the like, title? Like, like, yeah, like, would it have anything to do with, like, the art part of it or no? Yeah, so it's like, um, it's like, I can't, I don't know how to say it. <laughs> you know, like taboo in those games where you can't really say the word. So there, it's like what you're doing whenever you are writing out a script. You are a- Oh, oh no. <laughs> what was that? Editor? No, if you're actually writing out a script, you are oh. considered a- Author? Oh. A writer. <laughs> Yeah, a writer. <laughs> They're called staff writers. So staff writers, they they might not actually get assigned an episode. <laughs> I mean, I was like playing Taboo. I couldn't, I don't know, like I can't say staff. I can't say writer. I can't, I don't know. <laughs> but staff writers, they might not actually get um, an episode assigned to them, even if they're one of the ones who came up with the idea. Usually that might not be the case, depending on what, what set you're in, you know, what writer's room you're in, but they don't, they aren't guaranteed an episode. And they're kind of like the initial step of actually writing an episode when you're a staff writer, but that doesn't mean that you're going to get credited. They, they often don't get credited because it goes up to the story editor who then fills out the entire episode and, you know, does all the dialogue and things like that. Underneath the staff writers, you know what? Maybe I should give the title and you guys tell me what to do. Yeah, I feel like <laughs> that's Underneath the that. staff writers, we have the writer's assistants. Oh. You think you would have gotten that one? Because we just said, oh, this is what I thought. I think that's Does anyone know what the writer's assistants do? They help write. They help the writers, like they help. Uh, oh, and they also maybe do the reading and check with like any typos and like making sure things make sense sort of. Yeah, so they are in the writer's rooms with everybody and they are writing down the ideas that come up um, in the meeting, keeping an outline, a general outline of like what the ideas are so that the staff writers can have something to work off of. They can see like what the ideas were and then um, you know, fill it in with with the outline. Right, and also, like, and like you said, they 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 are sometimes given the task of proofreading a script before it's completely finalized to make sure there's no spelling errors and that you know the grammar is correct. And like you said, it just it makes sense and there's no story errors. Um, sometimes that'll fall above them, but it depends on again the production and the writers' room. And I believe you also talked about how. Sometimes they'll go back and look at the ideas to see the ones that they haven't used. They are, yeah, in charge of sometimes, depending on the production, the story Bible. If, if the show has a story Bible that they stick to during production and during the new seasons, um, they will be the ones to update it with any changes that have happened. Has any character died, fallen in love, moved away, said that they were born in a certain state? When whatever new information comes up, they update the story Bible so that it's easy to figure out um, what has been done and what the characters 
backgrounds are and, and what has happened as they write new episodes so that anybody coming into the show for the first time can look at that story Bible and kind of get an understanding of, of where they're at. Underneath the writer's assistants, you have the writing PAs or writing production assistants. Anyone know what they do? So I would assume that's not yeah. What was that? Get the coffee. And you, know, you can do that, yeah, they can get coffee, do. drinks, food, snacks, um, go out and get paper, refill the, the printer with paper, you know, all the it's little tasks like a... that need to be get done. It's like an assistant, not an assistant, it's like a, uh, well, yeah, it's kind of like an assistant to a, to so a it's boss. it's basically like a PA. Secretary or something. For the writer's room specifically. Yes. They can take calls, they can, you know, go run tasks, go pick up something. Do whatever the writer's room needs so that they can run smoothly and don't have to go out and do the stuff themselves. They might bring them lunch and things like that as well. That way the writer's room can stay in the writer's room. I mean, all the writers can stay in the writer's room and hash out the episodes without having to leave unless they're like on break or something. Well, actually, does anybody have anything to add to that? Or anything I mixed up? How about the how about the guest writers? The guest writers that is um, so yeah so shows have a requirement um, to take in a certain number of what is it called freelance screenwriting scripts. So there's like they're called spec scripts, and a screenwriter can write it. Someone who doesn't work on the show. And they can send it in as an episode idea. And um, according to the Writers Guild of America, there are requirements to have a certain number of episodes be picked up from those freelance writers so that those freelance writers can have some work at some point or there's better opportunity for them. Um, so that is something that anybody can do. I, I don't know if you have to be part of the WGA or not. I would assume so, right? Because I would assume you would, but I'm not exactly sure on that. You'd have to look into it. But basically, it means that a show, everyone in the writer's room, there's at least going to be one episode or something or a certain number of episodes per season, depending on how many episodes there are, that are going to be picked up from outside sources who have written an episode idea um, based on that show, based on those characters. And, uh, and yeah, so it, it helps give them an opportunity to write for that show. And then they might be brought into the show if they really like their spec script. It's happened before. Um, it's not as likely, but it does happen. All right, back to color. Does anyone remember which of these is additive color mixing? And which of these would be subtractive color mixing? Oh, um, editing would be the one with the white in the middle, right? Yep. And the black would be the one with subtractive. So the additive color mixing is on the left. Subtractive color mixing is on the right. What is the difference? One adds color right. and the other removes? No. Whether you use a print, depending, depending if you're using a print or um, R, RBG? Yes, RGB. Um, RGB. Yeah, so. Oh, that's what you mean. Well, no, there's, there's also what you said, but you said you're not. Uh, it's not taking away color, it's taking away light. Yeah, yeah, that was true. That's why there's black in the middle. So um, additive color, color mixing, is taking two different lights, putting them together, which makes the, which makes the, uh, the result brighter because you're adding two lights together. So if you add all three of the primary lights together, you get white when you're doing additive color mixing. 
Additive color mixing is used for any displays, computers. If you're going to edit and you're doing color grading, you're going to be using additive light because you're adding different, um, different light together to make the colors appear on the screen and produce it through the light. I don't know if, you know, scientifically, I'm probably speaking jumbly, but you know what I'm saying? Like, it's, it's basically you're mixing light together to make different colors appear. And because of that, you're making it lighter and lighter and lighter as you add those colors together. Blue, red, and green are the primary colors when you're talking about additive color mixing. And so if you're getting a color wheel and you're using color grading or anything like that, you need to know the differences between a additive color wheel and a subtractive color wheel because they are gonna be slightly different because the primary colors are going to be different. And um, you need to know this because if you're trying to take red out of your image, you need to pick the opposite side of the color wheel and add in, um, what is it? I think it's, does anyone know the answer to that one? I actually don't know the answer to that one. Is it adding blue or teal, green? Uh, the three colors. No, basically, if you're, if, if you're trying to take out certain colors in your color grading, you need to know what the opposite side of the color wheel is for the additive color mixing so that you can add in the opposite side of the color so it ends up taking away some of the I color. I still haven't memorized the color wheel, so every time they're like, oh, what's the opposite of this color? I was like, So in this color, in the additive color, if you look at the color uh, wheel, right? Mm -hmm. If you if you take blue out, you you'll get yellow, and if you take green out, you'll get red. Gotcha. Okay. So it actually shows up there, right? Well, whatever you're seeing, the green and red combination is yellow, mm. and uh, all three combination is white. So if you take blue out, then you get a yellow. If you take the green out, you get the red. If you take and, red out, you get cyan. Yes. Gotcha. So you'd want to add in cyan to get out the red, to, to reduce the red. And it's kind of just doing a balancing act of that whenever you are color grading or using any kind of additive color. Subtractive color is whenever you are using um, printing or paint or anything that is physical. And it's actually reflecting light back into our eyes. And that's how we see color on that object. It's not producing its own light, like the screens of a television or a computer or a phone. Um, so it's actually subtracting light when you mix them. Because the more you mix, the less light is going to be reflected. And that means there's going to be less light overall, which means it's gonna be darker, which is why when you mix colors and like with paint, eventually you get black if you just keep mixing color after color after color. Um, well, it has to be kind of like the equal amounts of the three primaries. Three primaries with paint is normally going to be red, blue, and yellow. And the three primaries on printing is going to be magenta, cyan, and yellow, as well as black. Yes, and the, and the good thing is that no matter which one you take, whether you take additive or subtractive, right? You can still get the other from it. Like for instance, if you look, the, you know, if you want to get an RGB, you would use magenta and yellow, right? Which will give you a red. And then if you want to use a blue, you get a, a cyan and magenta, which is going to give you a blue. And likewise for green, uh, which is exactly what you would get, what you would have on an additive color. Yeah. And so you can like you you the colors react the same way just oppositely to how they would if you're using additive or subtractive and you can always end up with the same colors by um by mixing the different primaries together in different ways right so you know i was reading somewhere that uh, when during the renaissance uh, renaissance period, period right the painters were mixing uh colors to basically get different shades mm -hmm. and uh, they would get these uh, pigments which would be very distinct uh, you know to get uh, the right colors that they want to paint and that's how the uh, additive colors uh, uh, the subtractive colors came about right so subtractive colors they could get 
you know, uh, this CMYK, right, uh, colors to get uh, different shades of it. And when the RGB came, it was completely like a different, uh, you know, the fluorescence tubes were uh, used to display stuff uh, from the red, white, uh, red, green, and RGB uh, uh, pigments that were put on that screen, right? So you get a different combination of that. So that's how RGB came out. RGB came out pretty late um, into the game uh, before it was all painters, uh, which had, uh, you know, that, uh, those uh, subtractive colors that they were dealing with for a long time. Um, mm -hmm. And when the RGB came, this confused the hell out of everybody because now they didn't know if it was C CYMK or they want to go with RGB. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that makes sense because it's so different because it just works oppositely to how, you, how you're used to before. Yeah. And I was reading that uh, the paint pigments were so popular in those times that uh, you know the painters would uh, write their will uh, and they were very expensive they were, they were write their will and uh, the inheritance would be given to their uh, kids uh, would be the pigments of these uh, paints because they were so expensive and it, it was part of the will which is kind of amazing you know like handed down paints for generations <laughs> <laughs> This is my family's paint pigment. I mean, it kind of makes sense. Like there are a few companies when it comes to like clothing or nail polish and stuff, they will create their own shades and trademark them. I mean, it's kind of hard to do because it's a lot harder to trademark a color than it is to trademark, let's say a very specific design. Yeah. But it is done. But yeah, so again, this is important because for production designers especially, they need to kind of have knowledge of both because they need to know, you know, cameras are going to use RGB, but the actual clothing, the actual props, the actual set design is going to be using um, cyan, magenta, and yellow as their primary. So it's going to be the opposite. And they need to know how those are going to react off of each other. And that way they can... Um, know what color they need to make it so that the final output is going to be the actual color that they want. Different lighting, um, different using different lights, different gels, different things like that. It's also going to change how the colors look on set. So that's going to be something that they have to talk about with a cinematographer to figure out, oh, if you're going to be shining a, you know, a, if you're going to be putting a blue gel over the light, it's going to make that yellow shirt look more green or it's going to make it look a little more um, purple or something if you do a, a magenta one or something like that. So they have to know kind of a mixture of all these different things that are going to happen with the color as well as thinking about what is going to happen in post-production with color grading to make it have the final look. So they have to have a, a good knowledge and understanding of these two different types of color mixing as well as the color wheels and the color harmonies and how they blend together and how they work because anything you do differently, any lighting you put on different clothing is going to change the look of the car. If it's a night shoot compared to a day shoot, that's going to change how everything should or would look um, depending on how you shoot it and how much lighting you have. So they have to think of all these things while they're doing it and while they're coming up with the color palette and thinking about the scene so that they can make sure that the that it matches and that it makes sense and that the final output is going to be what the director and they had discussed and what their vision was, what the director's vision was. All right, next we're going to get into a bit of um, some of the deliverables and distribution that you that usually whenever you're trying to make a distribution deal, these are some of the things that they are going to require depending on what kind of distribution you are going for. And some of these are just gonna be required pretty much on every single distribution deal you try to get. So name these deliverables and distribution and what they are. What is this first one? Obviously, I mean, it's right on the, uh, the paper. <laughs> Errors and omissions. 
Yes. Errors and emissions insurance. So E and O insurance. Emissions with two ends or one? Oh, it's with one. <laughs> Errors and emissions insurance. What is it? Uh, you're talking to me? Everybody, anybody who wants to answer. Yeah. I'm thinking about, uh, you know. Anyway, um, errors and emissions insurance is basically insurance for or things that might not be 100% like things that might have been left out, right? Either in contracts and stuff like that. Yeah, so it's it's uh, liability insurance against any kind of um, copyright, trademark, or contract claims that are um, like that was either omitted or <clears throat> not one hundred percent clear yeah it wasn't clear it was kind of like it, it could Open be taken either way and so the person suing them because they thought it was going to be something else oh. when really it was this and um, basically any miscommunication anything that's not like a 100 percent clear it's to make sure that they don't get sued and that that's covered in case there's any issue or miscommunication on their part it's to make sure that the distribution, the distributor that's taking on the film is going to be covered from this errors and emissions insurance. If the filmmaker or the producers or production company um, did not have everything 100% um, like if you accidentally filmed a logo on somebody's shirt and you didn't notice it and it went through quality control and stuff and nobody really noticed it. Um, but that company does notice it later on and they see that this movie's big and stuff. And so they sue the movie for using their logo without their permission. Errors and emissions would cover something like that. What it doesn't cover is complete negligence of, on your part as a yeah, filmmaker. Yeah, I was going to say. You have to really prove that it was... A deliberate accident that it went through all the checks and balances and like there was an actual like it makes sense the possibility of it being overlooked because if it's just like oh you didn't do your job then yeah I don't yeah if you don't have a contract with the actor and there's no talent release form and the actor's suing you because they don't want to be seen in that movie errors and emissions insurance was isn't going to cover that and if you lie about that to the insurance company, it's just like any other insurance, insurance fraud, and they don't have to pay it out because you didn't tell them all of the information. Um, yeah, so, so basically, when you're trying to get you. errors and emissions insurance, you have to show them all the paperwork and everything to show that you have yourself covered. And you usually have to show them. I'm not sure if you always have to show them the film or not. Um, it probably depends on the insurance and what you're trying to get, but. The distributor that you are working with will tell you the amount of insurance that you need to buy for the to cover. So it could be a million, it could be $10 million worth. Like it doesn't really have a limit. It just depends on the deal and what they need from it. <clears throat> and so you'd have to go out and get that and then show them proof that you have errors and emissions insurance and that you are giving it over to them. The film, I don't think there's anything else I missed on that. Also, I think, uh, what is that, uh, mistakes in the contract? Yes. Like any mistakes that are not uh, like negligence, like, you know, just, oh, I left out that, that clause. Something that's just like an, like an actual error. Like a typo? No, I don't know if it's an, a typo or if it's just like something that, like you said, wasn't really clearly stated. So it's kind of up for interpretation or something that was just kind of overlooked by by you it would have to be overlooked by you the insurance and the distributor right, for it to be before, able to be legible as a uh, claim on the right because the before you would like give them the contract you would make sure to go over it with the insurance and with the proper people to make sure that everything's correct before making the person sign it so if they also don't see it yeah and miss it then yeah then it 
they would have to cover, which makes sense. And so basically every distribution deal you do, they're going to require this because they don't want to be held accountable for any claims of, of uh, copyright or trademark or whatever kind of claim. They don't want to be vi uh, liable for it. They want to have some, they don't want to have to pay for it, obviously. So. And also something that is there in the contract and is not being followed by the, you know, uh, business unit. And that would also come under and somebody comes in later, you know, uh, claims it, then uh, they would be covered with uh, insurance, I think. Oh, yeah, I think you're right. So, yeah, it basically just covers any, any legal issues or any um, minor mistakes and things like that that were overlooked by multiple parties and uh, weren't really noticed until the claim was came around. How about, how about, uh, how huh? about insufficient funds for completion? What was that? Insufficient funds for completion. Like, for instance, if you run out of budget, does this insurance cover to get uh, you know the project completed? Can you draw from this uh, E and O insurance? No, so I think E and O is is just for the um, the legal paperwork side and that kind of stuff. If there's any claims against, mm. like I said, like copyright and stuff like that. If there's any errors or omissions, like something you left out of a contract that's now being mm. debated or being um, someone's suing for that would be the stuff that you know insurance covers there's other kinds of production insurance which do uh, what you're saying which is like um i don't know what kind of production insurance is called I would say that, that, contingency um, right what was contingency it also. contingency also covers that i think yeah yeah, yeah I, think contingency I would also insurance say that even for that like with any insurance it has to be very specific like it can't just be oh this budget was wildly mismanaged and they just threw money at the wall. You would have to prove that, for example, if there was a huge hike in price. If COVID happened. Yeah, if COVID <laughs> happened, if there was a huge inflation hike in the middle of production and everything was more expensive overnight. But you know what though, COVID happened, a lot of those insurance companies said it didn't cover it. I was like, man. Just yeah, like insurance. Like because <laughs> like insurance. I feel like those are ex extraordinary circumstances. Those are like things that are completely out of their control. And like there's, I feel like it's one thing to be like, oh, a normal natural disaster, which could happen, or a, a safety issue or something that could happen. But for you to go like, oh, and a worldwide pandemic, I feel like that's kind of like, it would affect them too. It'd be a lot harder to prove because everyone would be affected by it, you know? Yeah, so like that's a uh, force, it was it force majeure harder. or whatever it's called, where it's like a crazy circumstance that nobody thought of. So yeah, there are different things in insurance, but basically, once you deliver this to the distributor and you sell whatever rights you're selling to them, and the reason you're giving this e &O insurance to them is because they need to look out for themselves um, after that. So after that, you don't really have to worry about it. This insurance is more for when you're done with the film, not to cover anything beforehand. They say to get this early on if you are trying to make a story that's kind of based on somebody's life without getting their the life uh whatever it's called, life rights or whatever it's called, life story rights, I think. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, because technically, like, you don't really, you don't absolutely need that, but it depends on who the person is and how much money they have and how, uh, how important they are, basically. Story, yeah, basically, it's something like that. So it really depends uh, when it comes to that. But if you are pretty covered and you're doing a story that is your own, and you're creating a, or you're just making up a, a story. Coincidences, but it's not like exactly that, or you can prove that it was a unique idea before that person's, before they, you discovered of that person. Well, no, it's if you're actually basing it on somebody's life, you don't always need the, the rights to their life story. Um, I don't know the legalities in that, but I do know that 
they said like the ENO insurance, you want to get that early on. If you are trying to use somebody's life story without getting their mm-hmm. um, permission or paying them or making a contract with them basically, yeah. because it's not always needed depending on what it is. Um, because if it's a public story, anybody's able to use it, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but you still you know, want to get that to cover yourself in case there's a claim. By the way, I wanted, uh, by the way, I wanted to share something with you, with you all. Mm-hmm. Uh, the California, since we're talking accounting, the California Film Commission has uh, some sort of program that is going on, which is, uh, uh, it's like a short course for six weeks, I believe, which uh, trains you in becoming uh, film accountants. So they teach you about accounting. And uh, after six months, I think uh, they also uh, place you with uh, some, uh, you know, producer or some film uh, uh, unit, so cool. you can use your skills. So that's, that's going awesome. on. I think. Yeah, some, sometimes in September, if you, uh, if any one of you is interested, uh, I can send that information out to you, Dakota, and you can share it. Yeah, yeah. If you want to email me that, I can send it to the group through email and through um, the uh, WhatsApp. Okay. Thanks, Vish. Sure. All right. Next on the deliverables list, if you are trying for a theatrical run, you'll use this. Does anybody know what this is? That's oh, the oh, you go ahead. Sorry, what was that? That's for the, uh, for the theater. Yep. Yeah, you can go ahead. Digital <laughs> cinema <laughs> package. <laughs> Yeah, DCP, it stands for Digital uh-huh. Cinema Package. <laughs> yeah, that one. Not even. <laughs> All right, what is it? <coughs> it is a device that takes all the data need to talk that slowly. from oh. it's hard to <laughs> articulate it. It, it just takes, it's pretty much um, a format for, for movies in, in theater. Like it's addressing like speaker, you know, surround sound. And it's taking um, the highest quality, uh, what do you call it? Um, format for the big screen, should I say? Yep. Yep. It's basically just a... Um, <clears throat> hard drive or a file that has a certain type of um, format, like Brian was saying, where it is using like pretty much the highest bit rate available so that when it's shown in theaters, it doesn't look all grainy and ugly shown on a massive screen. It's uh, the highest bit rate. It's going to be a massive sized file, which is why it kind of needs its own device. And the only, re- and it's made for theaters, not for like home showings because there's certain projectors and certain devices that can play these hard drives and read that amount of data that quickly because it's so much data that it has to go through when processing it and showing it on the screens. But this is needed if you're gonna do any kind of theater run. So you have to either get, you can make them uh, yourself, but they are easy to mess up. And so a lot of people will go with um, a DCP lab i believe they're called which create it for you but obviously there's a cost to it and then you have to pay for the actual physical hard drive if they need a physical device to play it off of now some of them allow you to send it um, online because they have some kind of online service that can do that amount of data kind of like streaming but uh if it's like a local theater the most likely scenario is that they're going to need an actual hard drive I think there's also risks of like it being corrupted or not breaking out very quick. Yeah, there's there's definitely risks with the hard drive itself, with the file, because there's certain things you have to do to get it. So if you're trying to make it yourself, the only way you can test it is by going to a theater. So unless you know somebody at a theater that's going to let you use the screen for a second to keep trying it until you get it right, you're going to have to try to make sure you get everything right in the first go um, if you are trying to make it yourself. But anyway, if you are doing theatrical distribution, a distributor is going to require a DCP file. And the, uh, depending on the deal, they might do the hard drives um, or they might 
require you to get to give them the hard drives or distribute them to them for rent or for buying or whatever. It just depends on whatever deal you're making. All right, does anybody know what a dialogue list is? I give away this one because it's a little hard to see. So this is a dialogue list. It's another distributable, I mean, a deliverable that you need in a distribution deal sometimes and it, well, most of the time. Does anybody know what it's for? Basically, it's a list of all of the effect, sound effects you're going to need, all of the noises and things that you're going to hear. Um, sort of. It's, it's more for dialogue than noises. I mean, there are noises in there, of course, but it's more for dialogue so that you have, um, I believe it's using like subtitling and what does CC stand for again? Oh, it's basically subtitles. I don't know. It's the exact verbiage on it. Subtitles something that I forgot. What was it? Is it closed captioning? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there you go. So yeah, closed captioning. So it's used in those instances. So when you're distributing it to a certain place that needs to turn on subtitles or needs to have closed captioning, they have the timestamps of where that all goes so that um, if it's going overseas, they know where to put the um, the the uh, dialogue with subtitles at, like in the movie, since they don't speak that language, they can put the the subtitles in the right spot when it's set, so when it's spoken, so you need it at the right timestamp. Basically, a timestamped version of um, everything that's said. All spoken dialogue is transcribed, also with the names of who's saying it so that they know what the character is. If they want to put the character name in the subtitles or the closed captioning, they can. Um, there's also, it includes interruptions and pauses. Any relevant sound effects are included like sighing, coughing, and screaming, or other sounds like gunshots and doors, like Priscilla was saying. And music and lyrics are also there and they're encapsulated with the little music clef note to show that it's a song or it's music playing. Does anyone have anything to add on that? Dialogue lists? No, I, I have a question. Now, when you include the music, would that involve would that involve the the, orig, the, the original, you know, the the origin of the music? Like do you include that? Yeah, so if you have a if you if you're using a music in your film, you you know, hopefully you got the rights to it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but I'm you should have the rights there. to it at this point. If you're oh, trying okay. to go for a distribution, you should before you even try to use the music, you should have rights to it. Right. Um, and and then you would just if you're using a instrumental, you might put um, you know, the title of the thing starts playing. You know, and that might be your what you write in the dialogue list. That's the subtitle captioning. Or if you are showing a song, if you're listening to a song that has lyrics and there's actually somebody singing, then you would put the lyrics in just like you would put dialogue. So you would put it in the timestamp it and say when they're singing each line of that song. So unless it's not unless it's supposed to be in the background, you know, if there's people talking over it and it's kind of just supposed to be in the background, then it's not as important. You just kind of put the important dialogue and, and music in the front. So I know that there is a list where you make all the sound effects and stuff. So that would be a separate list. Um, yes, I mean, this you do put the sound effects in here, but this is more for the dialogue and the subtitles and things like that. Yeah, so you would have a specific one for those sound effects? Uh, I don't know which one you're Fully work and everything? Oh, that one's not for distribution. Fully work is done in post production. I know, but I know that there's also like a document showing all of the sounds and stuff, right? Because for people that have like sensitivity to certain noises, stuff like that um i'm not sure there might be for yeah, distribution the, might... the in in you know I've, I've seen this lately is when the 
music comes on, you know, if, and they are very specific as to what kind of music it is. They'll say sad music, mm-hmm. or uh, they will say the door shuts, you know, so, stuff like that. So it's becoming, I don't know, I think it's part of, uh, because those door those shuts and all that uh, will probably be coming from automated. I, I don't know, maybe the the filmmaker is basically providing that information. Yeah, so it depends on if the distributor needs the, the, it to be a deliverable upon the agreement or if they are going to do it themselves. And that all goes back into like the, the deal that you make with the distributor. And if you make that kind of deal where they're going to do it, they're obviously going to want more money to do um, to pay for the expenses because that's going to be ex, you know an expense for them. All right. To like map the background, out all of the all of the sound the effects. Background, background noise, you know, in the bar, if somebody is having having a conversation, they go. They, I've seen this that uh, uh, the subtitles comes on as you know noise, background noise, something like that. So, which is getting very specific. So, I was wondering <laughs> how specific, you know, the somebody is going to be has to go scene by scene it's just yeah, exactly uh, that's what i was thinking about sound effects too like shouldn't you also would be putting like oh the sound of this closing door yeah. closing thing opening thing yeah opening. you would do that in this so you would do like um specific sound effects that are like out in the open i don't know if you would do background sound effects in the dialogue list because there is yeah, another list it's probably getting automated a lot of stuff is because they see, they, you know, they say they hear the background noise. They'll probably have something in their database which will match it. And so it's okay, you know, maybe like a decimal decibel kind of uh, approach to, uh, you know, loud noise or something, which would trigger it out and give it as a subtitle. Of loud noise. I don't know. I'm just kind of. Uh, I do know there are um, there are services that do that. Like he's saying, like the automated. You like run it through. And then yeah. you hopefully have somebody that checks over it. So if you're hiring somebody to do these kinds of things, there's they, they sometimes use automation and like algorithms to find the, the dialogue, the noises, and yeah. like you say, and, and then write it out as a subtitle basically, or put it in this yeah, list. Think, and the then they kind of go through, a person should go through and like check it and make sure that it's correct and it's not mistaking yeah. it because those things can easily be mixed. Yeah, and that's up why everyone complains that like the captions on YouTube are absolute garbage because a lot of it is automated. Right, like especially I think for the closed captioning is was uh, originally for people who could not hear, right? Right. And uh, so they, you know, they, they can, you know, the more specific uh, it is to the scene, they would, uh, know what what's going on right like a sad music would be complimenting the scene uh, and so they know it's a sad scene right off the bat right yeah and i think that really just determines on you know how specific the whoever's doing it wants to get um because i like i like you i've seen you know i've watched netflix and seen like i put on subtitles and then sometimes it'll come on and be like saying the title of the thing or just be like sad melancholic piano music starts playing or whatever it is Mm -hmm. or sometimes it's just like piano music and it doesn't say what kind or anything about it it just says piano music so it just really depends i think on production to production how specific they want to get with it yeah i still feel it would be really annoying if it's like piano music and you can't hear it you're like well what kind of piano music Exactly. Yeah, it's a lot of sounds. <laughs> yeah, it can be sounding like I'd anything. I'd be really annoyed. Yeah. Yeah. Let me see if I have anything. Um. Nope. Okay. All right. The next thing. It's in the name right up here. Does anyone want to read that out? <laughs> Combine continuity right, um... and spotting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna read it. <laughs> All right. Combined. Combined continuity and spotting list sample. Yep. So it's a combined continuity and spotting list. Does anybody know what that is? Sort of. Well, isn't it like checking kind of like 
the document that consistency. you have with the supervisor? So it's kind of, it's doing, um, this I think it's more of like the, the audio description kind of stuff where it's describing the scene, it's describing stuff that's happening. Let me check because I actually wrote down what it is to make sure. It's a script giving a complete action, the scenes, and more all in detail in the order in which they are shown on screen. They include sound effects, actors, accents, emotions, other information. Yeah, so this is that's what I thought. It's like the description, the audio description stuff. If you ever watched Netflix, it will tell you a man walks in holding this thing. He looks mad. He's clenching his jaw. It's very descriptive. So unlike this other list, which is just the dialogue and like the noises and like laughs, pants, size, um, and who's speaking, as well as like the main sound effects and stuff, like we said, or music that starts and what kind of music it is. This one is more for describing the scene and describing what is happening so that, and, and you have to time code, timestamp it as well so that they know when to insert this information. So if you're watching the audio dialogue description, this is the kind of list you would use so that you could see, um, you could hear what exactly is happening. And that's more for like, you know, blind people or somebody who doesn't really want to watch the screen. They're just kind of having it on in the background and they're over to the other side of the room or something. I really, really hope that audio description becomes more of a thing with streaming services because that I know of, I could be wrong, but Netflix is the only one that does it right for me because I have it automatically on in my phone and it will, like if it has it available, it will automatically turn it on. And Netflix is the only one that does it mm. that I've seen. Like HBO might do it. I don't know. Maybe the settings just aren't right. But I just, I really hope that that becomes more of a normal thing because it does make a huge difference. And depending on the distributor, they're either going to request one or the other or both. It just really depends on what kind of distribution they're trying to do. If they're trying to do international, they're probably going to try to get, you know, as many things as they can. That way it's as clear as day what's happening whenever it's sent overseas to other, um, other countries that speak other languages, they can easily put subtitles, easily interpret it, easily change stuff to their own language and all of that based on these different forms. Um, but it will really depend on your, distribu your distributor, which ones they require, because they might just use this as a dialogue list. It really just depends because it's going to kind of have all of the dialogue and the speakers anyway. Um, so it really just depends on what they feel they need and what they, what, what their partners that they've worked with before need. Does anybody have anything to add to that actually? Uh, anything I left out or anything? All right, so next thing, <laughs> again, it's at the top of the, the title of it, is at the top. You want to read that out? Nina title. Woo! <laughs> All right, does anybody know what that is? What is a chain of title? It's showing the list of what you're working on first in order, right? In a production? Nope. Yeah. No? Nope. What good guess? Yeah. Just... What? <laughs> what do you want me to say? <laughs> good guess, though. Oh. <laughs> All right, chain of title is a, not really one thing, it's more of a combination of all of the different documents that make up whoever holds the rights to that film. It's all of your contracts. Oh, I remember now. That's great. All of your <laughs> location release contracts, all of your talent release, crew contracts, um, story rights. You know, if, if, a, if a screenwriter wrote it, you have to, buy the rights from them or have some kind of deal with them about you get the movie rights, but they hold on to whatever other rights. If you're getting it from an author that wrote a book, what kind of rights do you have from them? Can you only do a film in North America or can you distribute internationally all over the world? Basically this 
chain of title is going to show exactly what rights the independent filmmaker or the production company owns so that the distributor knows exactly what they are buying. That way the filmmaker is not saying, yeah, yeah, you can do international when really all they have the rights to is national um, distribution for a film, for that film, for those story rights. It also shows you who has the rights to what when trying to acquire specific parts, right? Like a song or a scene or... Yeah, just any element that's added or, or you know, any creative element that anybody has worked on, they have to have that contract to show that they signed over the rights to you to use that music. They signed over the rights to you to show their likeness, you know, their voice, their, their face, the actors, uh, or the behind the scenes. Whatever you have, you have to have those contracts in place. And basically the chain of title is just giving all of those contracts to show to the um, distributor so they can look through everything and read through it and figure out what exactly does this filmmaking company own and what exactly am I going to own whenever I buy this uh, film from them. Does anybody have anything to add to that? I think you covered it pretty well. But yeah, I think I was getting it mixed up because I do know that there is a list of that was last semester that that shows like what you have to do first as far as not just editing but also product the entire line of production. So I think I got it mixed up with that. That was a list I made, not really like what you need, but yeah. I know I know, but we were talking about it, and so I think I got it mixed up with that. Gotcha. All right. All right. Does anybody know what this next thing is? I, I, I put it in the title at the top. Quality control. Yes. Oh, QC. Oh, QC report. <laughs> no, it's quality control. You're right. Oh, okay. Um, QC report stands for quality control report. Does anybody know what that is? It's, uh, it's basically going through every single thing and making sure that the audio is perfect. There's no like issues and stuff like that. The visuals, there's no like like issue with the scene, with the recording, right? Yeah, so it is a um, it is a thorough viewing of the film, going through it step by step, making sure that um, you have to actually pay a company to do this. You can't just do it yourself because a distributor is not gonna trust that you did it um, correctly. So you do it through a company that does quality control reports. And it's basically a thorough viewing and they, they mark it with like a one, two or three based on how severe it is. One being like very noticeable and needs to be changed. Two being like, it's probably going to be seen by viewers, but it's okay if it's left in. Three being like, eh, it's some minor thing, but you know, if you can fix it, if you have the funding and the time. Uh, and then they have like, uh, I can't remember what the last thing's called, but I think it was like informational or something where it's basically just like, FYI, this is something that uh, you might want to think about. It doesn't really change the film or anything. It's just the color, you know, something like something that doesn't actually affect the color or the viewing experience or the, the audio. Um, but yeah, so they'll go through the film, make sure the audio and the video are good. If there's any, if there's any visual effect elements like grain or noise and if how heavy it is and how noticeable it is if there's any obviously if there's any like um missing media all of a sudden it just turns into a blank screen or there's one frame missing or there's accidentally another scene cut in between this other one obviously those are gonna be like the big changes that need to happen if there's any audio that cuts out or goes above um zero and it's distorting or it's too quiet, those are things they're gonna point out. And then they give you that list and you fix all of the stuff that they said to fix and then choose you know, how much money and time you have to fix the rest of the twos and the threes. And then you um, send it back to them. They do a less thorough report where all they're doing is checking the problems that you were supposedly fixing, making sure they're good to go. 
and then signing off on it saying this is good. So the distributor knows that it meets technical requirements and that the audio and video are going to be um, good and not distort or have any problems whenever they're trying to show it to streamers or Yeah, because theaters. if you have a film that has all of these issues and they're not addressed, it looks really bad on the distributor when they go to distribute it and there's like a bunch of issues and stuff that wasn't, that doesn't look professional or wasn't taken care of, especially very small things. Yeah. And so distributors will often require you to get one of these done to make sure it meets the specs. Sometimes some deals, they'll do it themselves or they'll take it on themselves to do it or to send it out to a third party company. Uh, but again, that means that the expenses that they incur are going to be higher, which means whatever revenue comes in, it's going to be less that falls down that waterfall. Does anyone have anything to add to quality control reports? Yeah, basically, I think uh, in the, all the problems that are there with your film would be uh, addressed in this uh, report. And uh, essentially, um, you know, like uh, Priscilla was mentioning that before it goes to the distributor, uh, these needs to be absolutely must be fixed. Um, otherwise, I think it will just uh, appear badly when it's screened, even for the I don't know if it's done before the producers or if it's you know before they show it to the producers or uh, it's the director's cut or maybe before it actually uh, goes to screening uh, because I think the distributors basically take the whole film and then run it uh, through maybe the trial run to figure out if everything is working okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, this thing needs to be done fixed before uh, before uh, even the distributor can touch it. Yeah, because the distributor doesn't want to buy it from you if it's going to be problems for them unless they work it into the deal that they will fix it themselves. Right. Yeah. So usually, usually they're like, hey, you know, do a quality control and make sure that it's good. If it's good to go and they sign off on it, we'll take it in. Uh, if it's not, make sure you fix the problems and then give it to us because we don't want to buy a broken product. And I think you made a good point is that uh, usually it's you, the, you know, if you have a third party thing uh, who's doing the QC, you're better off because uh, usually sometimes when you're doing in an environment and it goes out outside the environment because which is where it, it would eventually land up. And, uh, you know, going outside for the testing is a better idea because, you know, if uh, there are some problems inherent with uh, your film because of uh, you know being very local, uh, but when it, when it goes outside, it sees the world, and then you know what if it has any problems more clearly. Then, uh, if you have, would have taken directly to the distributor. Yeah. Whatever the heck that sound is, Joe. Yeah, like that. <laughs> that would be cut out. Yeah. Exactly. All right. What about this? Does anybody know what this would be? Another deliverable. Music and effects. Yes. Mm -hmm. Music and effects track. Does anybody? Well, does anybody know what that is? Isn't that for the editor at the end of the um, at the end of the production? Like, you know, to, like, to add on, because usually I heard that, uh, this is what I've heard, that these effects are added on. They're yeah, so this, that would be just like um, sound effects and things like that in post-production. Yeah. And then right. after all of that is done, um, this is done for distribution. Okay. So like the sound effects and the music and stuff should be in there and kind of be in the final stages. Well, no, it should definitely be in the final stages before you try to go into distribution. So uh, you know what the mix is and everything. Um, but does anyone else, well, do you want to take another guess or does anybody else want to have a guess? What this would be for? I think it's, is everybody going or? Are you good? Okay. No, no, so, go ahead. Yeah, so 
essentially music and effects track is a solo track where which goes with um, the film as such, uh, the video tracks. And uh, when, especially if you're going international, the M&E M- 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 track, uh, you know, is there and the dialogue track is replaced by uh, the dialogue dubbing that they may do. So they will keep the video track and they will keep the ME track as it is uh, because those are basic uh, fundamental to the whole, uh, you know, sound. And uh, they will just replace the dialogue track. Yes, exactly. So whenever you have a full track, you have the dialogue, the music and the effects and they're all combined. But whenever it's going international, they don't want to have English speaking people sound, they don't want to have the words of English speaking people in the audio, because then if they try to put their audio over it, they have to cut out each word, or they have to figure out a way to overlay it and quiet down just the dialogue. And that's very extremely difficult. So instead, um, they request that you create a music and effects track that is just the music and just the sound effects together, fully mixed cutting out all of the dialogue from all of the speakers. And that way, just like Vish said, the, any international dubbing that is done, they can put their language in place of where the English speaking dialogue would have been. And so that way there's no cluttered audio mess. It would be easier for editing in general, whether you're dubbing or not too. Yeah. And uh, the other thing about it is, um, the other thing I was going to mention is that is also why you have that dialogue list, why you have that continuity and spotting list that we looked at earlier. It's not just for subtitling, it's also for dubbing so that they know the exact time stamped code that time code that uh, each part of the dialogue is spoken. That way they can, when they are doing the dubbing, they can put it in the exact same spot so that it kind of lines up a bit better. Um, Obviously, it won't be perfect because every language is going to have a different length of speaking depending on what the sentence is and what the words are, but it'll be at least close enough to where it can pass for the the person speaking when they're opening their mouth, the other language is coming out, that kind of thing. Um, I think, does anybody else have anything to, to say about music and effects tracks? I think we pretty much said it all. Yep. But yeah, so it's, it's mainly like the, it's just international distribution so that they can do dubbing because not everybody's going to want to have subtitle. All right, does anybody know what this is? I actually put this in there for you, Tim. For who? Everybody. Oh. Uh, uh, oh. A forced narrative. Does anybody yeah. know what that is? Yeah, so Spanish, is that the false narrative? No, by York. I mean, it might be. Is that Spanish? <laughs> I don't know what that is. Because <laughs> it looks different to me. It looks forced. Well, know. if you were going for like... Portuguese, it would have been <laughs> Yorki. With a, okay. uh, they, they, they say it no, it says Nova York up there. Oh, right. <laughs> if it's in Spanish, <laughs> I have no idea because I only know like one type of Spanish. So I don't really know. So force narratives is going through the film and time stamping anywhere that there needs to be um, subtitles that won't be taken away if, or subtitles or any kind of titling that won't be taken away even if the person turns off subtitles in the film. Because it'll be something like the location when they put like New York up in the screen. Whenever that is distributed to other countries, they need the force narrative um form that'll show where those titles happen so that they can translate it and put it somewhere else on screen so that's why you see nova york uh, nova is that like uh german yeah. i don't know <laughs> i don't know what language that is so well in portuguese nova also means mm-hmm. new. new um in spanish it would be written nueva so it would be differently Either way, it just um, whatever country they're sending it to, they want to also put 
um, especially in countries where they have a lot of English speakers and um, other speakers like maybe French and English mix or like something like that. Yeah. Then they want to have it both in English and in and in French. I actually have screen. seen a lot of Canadian films do that where they will have like a lot of stuff in French or a lot of stuff in English if the movie is in French. Yeah, and that's because they have a lot of both. So they want to show both at the same time because the, you know not everybody's going to speak both languages. Um, and anytime there's a, a foreign language that we are supposed to understand what is being said, like with Stranger Things, when they were talking in Russian in the newest season, we were following along with the subtitles. And even if you turn subtitles off, that wouldn't go away. That's forced narrative because we wanted to, they wanted us the to see. The story wants us to know what they're saying. Yeah, they're so those subtitles scenes. are baked in and they're not going anywhere. They're not like other subtitles. You can also notice that there were also scenes where there weren't subtitles and they were speaking Russian. So like they had what we were supposed to see in sub, uh, supposed to understand in the subtitles and what wasn't important for us to understand like didn't really do that right and so like anything that's important like if they're showing a a sign and it's showing that um let's say it says new york 30 miles that way then you want to put that in other languages so that would be a moment where you you put that in with the uh force narrative document to show like where that happens so that when it does go to those other countries they know exactly the time synced spot where that happens so they can add their own language and figure out where on the screen they need to add it to so that people can read it and it's not just english speaking people or whatever country that it originated from um, that is making that um, content and that way everybody can understand what it is they may have anything to add to that yeah i think uh, you know people who are doing dubbing in uh, let's say Russia or uh, Japan, right? Uh, they have no idea where this, uh, let's say if, if this picture was without the first narrative, uh, New York is not there. They'll have to make a guess as to where this is coming from. So being specific, New York just solves their problem. They don't really have to guess and they say, okay, you know, the first narrative is there. They'll go with it and then you know, whatever subtitling they have. So it establishes the location very clearly uh, without really having the people dubbing, uh, you know, to come up with where the city is. Right. Or you have a lot of movies where they have those like famous landmarks and I'll just show that. So the yeah, born, born movies show like where it's from everywhere. What? And so they would, what the Bourne movies like when they're going to a new city because he travels all over the place? Mission Impossible. Uh, so they'll yeah. put like you know Chicago, New York. That way you know exactly where they're at. Um, and so that would be also the force narratives where you bake it in and you show like basically this form is for other countries to know exactly where those subtitles or titles or book sign book titles or signs or any text. If you're showing a phone text message conversation. That's another forced narrative because anything that isn't going to be translatable on screen needs to be put in there so that they can translate it and put it somewhere else so that the other language um, viewer can follow along and get the same amount of story elements that they would. Going along with that, what are these? Does anybody know what this would be called? So this is like when you have the text and you're taking it out. All right, so these are called textless elements. And this is where if you have like a title or you have um, some form of text on screen in a language, you also supply alternate versions where that text is not there. That way the other language can input their own language over. So unlike forced narratives, forced narratives have both languages on screen. You still have the English or whatever language it originated from 
on screen and then you add the other language somewhere else. So in this case, New York was at the bottom of the screen and they added um, Nova York at the top. That way it's not over on top of each other and just both languages on screen at once. But let's say they didn't want to have the English version of New York in there at all. They just wanted to put New Nova York in place of it. Then they would require a textless element where they have that same footage of whatever this shot is. It just does not have the overlaid text of New York. That way they can put their language in it. And so basically it's just showing like what it's, what used to be there, what it said and what needs to be in place of it. I say typically you're not going to need textless elements whenever it's over a white or black blank screen. That can usually, usually be like forced narratives. But if it's over an actual piece of the footage, they decide um, what language they want to put it in or if they even want to put it in at all. So, yeah. Now, this is the one. All right. So, so does anybody know what this is? A TV show Bible or also known as a series Bible. Talked about this like 30 minutes ago, maybe more. Basically, it's just a book of continuity, storylines, stuff that we've established in the story, right? Yeah, so there, um, there are two versions of it. There's the production TV show Bible. I mean, there's not two versions, but there's two use cases of it. There's the production TV show Bible, and there is the pitching TV show Bible. So go ahead, Anna. What? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, what? Weren't you explaining what it was? Wasn't that pretty much it? No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, did we hear something? So it's, um, it's, a, it's, it's a document that's describing the characters in the, in the project. It's giving an ep episode synopsis of what happens, kind of like just a brief paragraph of what happens in each episode mm -hmm. and what the ideas are. Um, it has a one page pitch that is going to be a, a basic, like a large summary of what the show is all about. Um, it could also include pictures from like different things to kind of give the feeling of what they're going for. And that is when they're using it as a pitch. When they're pitching it to the executives, they kind of want to give an illustrative demonstration of what the show is going to be. And a TV series Bible is the best way to do that because it shows where this show could go, what the ideas are for it right now, what the ideas for the look and feel of it are, who's in this show, what characters are there, um, and just kind of like how each episode will work, what the format is. Let's see if I can look. Does anybody have anything to add to that? And then also uh, for the production one, they're kept so that they can be updated and um, followed along with the writing team can come in and look at it if they need to, to remember what happened last season, you know, what the major plot points were for each character and stuff like that. If any character died or said, oh, my sister just died or something like that, that could be added in to make sure continuity is maintained for the character's background story. It also, it also helps state, um, what? What are you saying? Are you? Anyway, um, it also helps with, um, it also helps with uh, keeping like an idea of what storylines are already used, which ones were not and where we left things in the last episode, you know? Yeah. So that it doesn't get confusing and messy and all this stuff. Especially for the next season so that they can like see like what happened last season and get a really quick um, like document to catch up on that. Does anybody else have anything to add to it? All right, what is the psychology of color? 
basically how color affects our emotions, our perception, and um, it's like a theory, it's not like a set thing, but how you can use color to manipulate people's perceptions, feelings, and idea of the things being shown on screen. Yep. Will certain colors always evoke certain emotions? Uh, yes and no. It, it's, it really depends on what you're using that color for. There are certain colors that are more known for certain emotions, but that also varies very widely when you're looking at different cultures, different times, um, different countries. Um, there are some that we associate more with certain emotions than others, but a filmmaker can very much, while he's creating a film, during the story, he can set a specific color for a specific mood or for a specific emotion or tone that he's going across and have that be the set color during that movie. Yeah. You know that, right? Everything I wrote out, you, you basically just said. Um, like you can see in the picture above, <clears throat> with red, pink, purple, navy blue, green, blue, orange, they say like these give off different instinctive emotions and um, reactions. And like Priscilla said, it really depends on territories and countries because certain countries have gold more as a like a, a luxury item or luxury color or like being rich, whereas others might not. Purple, same thing, it could be royalty or it could be something else. Um, and so it really just depends, but depending on where you are, you can definitely give off different emotions easily by using different colors because they are already associated with different things like red being um, passion or love, you know, using red to, to show that pink as well, showing love or femininity is um, commonly used. So those things are used because that we already associate those with certain, certain things. That doesn't mean that you can't do it though, because you can, in your film or your TV show, you can set up a certain color to mean something, anything. It could be anytime there's a bright orange color on screen, that means something really bad is getting ready to happen. Bright orange is usually meant for like, you know, warmth and the sun and feeling good. But if you set it up in your film that every time there's something bright orange in the film, something really bad happens, subconsciously your audience will start to get that feeling every time they see orange. They won't really know why unless they pick up on it. Um, but usually they're not gonna pick up on why, they're just gonna kind of be like, oh, I have a weird feeling about this. And that's because you've, you've already established that orange equals bad. Yeah, more often than not, people will only notice it if, they're, if they see a pattern, if they're actually looking for it, or if they think back to it. Or like they're while studying. you're watching it, more often than not, people won't notice it immediately. Does anybody have anything to add on, on that? It's not on a conscious level. Yeah, I think, you know, some of these colors can be pretty dangerous because they may have like a religious connotation. If you use it at the wrong place, then, uh, you know, they, they could be uh, issues related with it. Yeah, I feel like, I mean, I don't know that much about every single religion ever to say, to say if it's dangerous or not, but there is definitely a cultural shift and a cultural clash um, depending on um, how you use that color and if it's going to international audiences. Like, I feel like a lot of people um, in Western culture have gotten really used to white being colored for weddings. And so that's something that's a little more known, but in the Middle East, white is used a lot for funerals and mourning. So that would be like a big cultural clash that maybe is a little smaller because of how um, interconnected our world is. But yeah, you can definitely, you definitely have to be more sensitive and careful and do your research. If you want a film to appear in other countries and to make sure that if you're going with 
your specific choice of how to use these colors, especially that you're not being insensitive or going to end up having a cultural clash when distributing them to other countries. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Vish, that is a very good point. Thank you. All right, for television scripts, how do multi-cam show scripts differ from single cam show scripts? Um, multi-cam with the script? Yeah, so the script will be different if it's a multi-cam show, um, like a sitcom that has multiple cameras compared to a sitcom that just uses a single camera. They're gonna be written, the script is actually gonna be written differently a bit. There's um, gonna be different formatting stuff. So there are certain parts in certain scripts where it says camera one or camera three, right? Mm. Uh, that's more like the shooting script whenever you're figuring out like, plus uh, on a multi-cam, not, not usually because they kind of just pick that in the, as they go in the edit. Oh, okay. Because I do know that there are some scripts that have that, like now we move to this camera or to that camera. Yeah, and so that would be like a single cam script, but that would be a shooting script for use on set usually to figure out like which actual camera to use. If you're writing out a script, uh, you don't really want to add any camera information in there because you want the director and the cinematographer to be able to choose what they want to do with the material. Anybody else have any guesses? <laughs> I don't think you mentioned uh, camera one, camera two on the script at all, right? Right. I mean, like, so if you're doing a shooting script, that would be like for use of the cinematographer, the director on set. Yeah, and also, but the, the yeah, when you're actually writing a script, like just writing a story out, no, you you shouldn't really say anything about cameras or like that kind of thing. Yeah, because... you say you say that, but there are specific scripts that have it when the director is also the writer or when it's just well yeah because they're kind of already writing out their own yeah. script so if you're writing out your own script you know you can do it however you however you're going to understand it but if you're going to write out a script for a crew to understand or to send off to a different director or to try to sell you definitely don't want to put any kind of camera information in there yeah so the difference between these two from what i've heard um, and what i've seen Multiple multi cam scripts, they have um, just like up in here, right underneath the, um, the slug line. The slug line is often underlined or the headline. It's also known as um, it's often underlined in a single cam script. That's not usually done. You don't usually underline it. Also, the characters might be put in parentheses and named underneath the slug line or the headline. Whereas on a single cam script, you don't do that. All of the action is capitalized in a multi-cam script. And so you see it right here, every single part of it is, is capitalized. Whereas single cam scripts, you only capitalize things that are important or things like new characters that, are, that weren't in the script before or like a noise that is very um, jarring. You might underline stuff like that. But in a multi-cam script, all the action is capitalized. So the character names are underlined when they're introduced. So we see, oh, we open on Leonard. That's the first time Leonard's mentioned, so he's underlined. Uh, entrances and exits of characters are also might be underlined. So emerges through a door, for instance that's underlined. And because you see like sitcoms with multicams, they usually have those moments where they kind of pause on that moment. And it's uh, important because my, maybe it's a guest star and they know people are gonna be cheering or people are going to be like, oh my gosh, or whatever. So they don't wanna do anything too quickly to where um, the people aren't paying attention to the show. Oh the yeah, that makes happen. sense. Cause there is in the script like pause for applause or applause for laughter pause for reaction mm -hmm. that kind of thing you even like i don't know if it's as noticeable to most people or it's just noticeable because we're learning about it but since we've been re-watching some of our shows i've been noticing 
when they stop in the in the live studio audience laugh, laughs and stuff and they're just like it, it's it's like only a couple seconds because they cut it but because we were learning about it it was just so noticeable last time i watched yeah, and it's just because it's set up much more like a play. So it's kind of written out like a play in a way, too, because there's certain moments that are going to take up more time and the people writing it know it. And so they know that these need to be um, clearly demonstrated that this is an important thing or this is a separate moment. Honestly, kind of stuff. I would even say I would even give props to an actor that can do that well, because I feel like it does take a certain talent to not just be like standing still while people laugh, but to actually keep your face, keep your like position so that you can keep on going or make it feel natural. Like it's a natural pause that humans make that people make when they talk. Yeah. And so that's like a different way of acting. That's why theater and screen actors sometimes have a hard time uh, transferring over from one to another because it's a little bit more exaggerated and it's, you have to remember different amounts of lines and uh, different pauses in certain places and things like that. But um, also in multicam scripts, the dialogue is often going to be double spaced. You can see that right underneath where it says Sheldon. All of the dialogue yeah, is double spaced. Um, yeah, I guess so. Huh. All of the dialogue is double spaced in this script. Not every single multicam script is going to have these things, but you know, multitude of them do. Um, the other thing you'll see is acts are clearly defined and labeled. So it's like act one or it's cold open and that's like in the middle and it's shown and it's separated always on a different page from the rest of the stuff. Whereas in a single cam script, you don't really break it down and say which act is act one, act two and stuff like that. Um, the other thing that, oh, sounds are often underlined and also have uh, are put off with like the word sound with an underlined um, sound effect right after that. So sound colon door slam. And that way it stands out because all the, the action is capitalized, they have to make it stand out some way. And that's, that's how they do it. And and then the other thing is that parentheticals are a lot more common in multicam scripts than they are in single cam scripts, and they are part of the dialogue. So I kind of did a little um, demonstration there where it's mark, yeah, comma, and then in parentheticals, unsure, clearly. And then he looks down, I don't know, maybe not. And that way they kind of know how to read the line, whereas single cam scripts, they don't really put how it's read as much because and they want the director and the actors to decide. Yeah, and if you do put a parenthetical, which they are very rare, you would put it before the line. Yeah, in a single cam script, it would go right under his name. It would be unsure. And then it would have the rest of the line with no parentheticals um, in the actual dialogue. Whereas a multi-cam script, it's part of the dialogue. I feel like it and also- There's a lot more of them. It also is a lot help, more helpful since they have um, so much to shoot and stuff. A script like this would really help them to know their movements and to know their cues so that they don't have to do as many retakes. Yeah, it's because pretty, it's it pretty much just so they know exactly how it should be read out and how it's blocked in a way. Well, more so than you would in a single cam script where you have a bit more time yeah. to flesh it all out. But yeah, does anybody have anything to add to that? Multi-cam scripts compared to single cam scripts? What's uh, the one on the top uh, of the slug, uh, scene slug? Uh, Slash oh, you mean like the headline or the slug line? Yeah, well, no, the uh, the cold opening, right? Slash A, what is that? Slash A. Um, I'm not actually sure, but I do know that cold opening would just be like the very beginning. So it'd be that would be where the act break would go to. If it was like act one, that could be what A is. They might do like A, B, C. Uh, it mm -hmm. just really, I don't know. It really depends on what the uh, process is for, um, what show is this? The Big Bang Theory. Big Bang Theory. I guess it just depends on how they, how they do it. But yeah, that would be like uh, where I've seen other scripts, they have um, act one, 
or cold open or act two, act three, and then they have a different page, different part of the page that's um, once it ends, act two ends or cold open ends, and then they go into act one. All right, I think there's two more questions. So <clears throat> what is the name of this tool that is used by a production designer? Okay, this looks a lot more like a mood board than Yes. Oh, okay. Mood board. What are the main uses of a mood board? To get the feel, tone, and look of the project across, basically. Yeah. Yeah, so it's um, they are to illustrate the idea that is in the director's and production designer's head to the rest of the crew, and also use as a reference point for the director and the production designer as they go forward with the uh, film. You know, what was our original ideas, and do I need to change the stuff? And um, you know, this is the kind of lamp I'm looking for. And so then, when they're looking online, they can go back and look at their mood board and reference it. Uh, let me see, do I have anything else? There's also certain crew members that can make their own mood boards. So the production designer kind of makes an overall view at costumes, props, sets, locations, everything kind of combined into one. Costume designer will make a costume mood board. Set designer can make a set or location mood board. Props master can make a prop mood board. It just depends on what they're role is and how detailed they want to get but that way they can do it as a reference point and to illustrate it to the director so, and other crew members so since we're here name the uh, what's the difference between a mood board and a lookbook i mean i kind of know i just you know since we're already here we might as well so a mood board is kind of like a collage of what the film represents in mm -hmm. a way like with the costumes the characters the locations whatever you want to put into it it's kind of like a a big jumble of the feeling and the look of the film. A lookbook is kind of the same thing, but it's more put in order of how the film would play out. So instead of just having it a big jumbled mess, they might have it in a more organized manner showing which characters show up when, what they might look like at that time, and then going forward in the scene and, and describing um, maybe like parts of the scene and what happens. You know, so if at the beginning of your film, your character is very optimistic, you might say, you know, he's very optimistic, he's happy, he looks forward to going out to do to, to, to dinner or something, whatever. Um, and then as you go through your lookbook, you're showing his progression and his change and his wife divorced him, now he's sad and this and that, but he meets someone new, now he's happy again. Whatever's happening in your film, it kind of shows the kind of like an outline, a visual outline of the story. And whatever this mood board movie is, they show like lamps and tables. Oh, in this mood board? Yeah. Yeah, does anyone have anything to add with that mood board or lookbook? So lookbook, I would like to add uh, some of the stuff also to it. So lookbook is something which you would uh, pitch with. Um, it would include stuff like character bios. It would include uh, the you know, major uh, people who are involved with the project, uh, you know, director, cinematographer. And um, it also include uh, stuff like uh, act one, act, th act two, act three, what is, uh, you know, what is happening uh, during uh, the time period, right? Uh, during the duration of the film and also some sort of, marketing and distribution uh, stuff that you need to, that you plan to do for your uh, project. You know, just thought, some thought has gone into it. So essentially you're taking uh, a lookbook and giving it to the producer or maybe uh, somebody who's, uh, uh, who is gonna be funding you, you know, to give you, uh, give them an idea as to what your, uh, what you have in your mind. So it's like a, complete thing, uh, which uh, 
you know, which is a little different from the mood board. The mood board is essentially giving you, uh, you know, what mood uh, settings uh, for the movie are. And, uh, you know, uh, and it's more for internal and external both uh, to uh, refer to as to. Yeah, so it's a lot more like a um, TV show's Bible. Yeah. Right. With the lookbook, not the mood board. But yeah. All right. I think this is the last question. What are, well, this is a kind of a combined question, but this is the first part of it. What are character arcs? Character arc is the journey that the character takes throughout the story. Right? Like their growth, their development, what lessons they learn, yeah. what journey they go through. Pretty much. Let me see what I wrote just to see. Basically how the character changes or remains the same over time throughout the film or the show. There are many different character arcs a character can go through to transform and change for the better or the worse, or they might not change at all. Or they might go from changing to, for the better to go back to how they were in the beginning, there's a different waves to the character arcs, but basically like Priscilla said, it's just how they change or how they grow or learn or not. There's also that. There's also a character arc where it can be flat, where they don't really change at all throughout the series. How they just remain static. Or the show or movie. How they react as well, I suppose, because they might not change, but they might react in different ways throughout the story. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is a, uh, a little diagram that Studio Binder has, and it has four different endings for characters um, that you mainly get from their different combination of wants and needs and whether they get them or not. So according to Studio Binder, there are four story endings that you can leave for your character. There's a sweet ending, a semi-sweet ending, bittersweet ending, and a bitter ending. You achieve these by giving or not giving the character a mixture of what they want and need. So starting from the top left, let's place the different endings. Top left, the character is going to achieve what they want and what they need. What kind of ending would that be? That would be the ideal ending, right? The happy ending? Sweet. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's so a sweet, semi-sweet, um, bittersweet, and bitter. Okay, so that one would be sweet. That one would be sweet ending. They get everything they want and everything they actually need. So uh, everything's all happy, go lucky. The second one, character fails to achieve what they want, but achieves what they supposedly need would be the bittersweet. Semi-sweet. All right. So achieving what they need, but not what they want. Uh, sometimes what characters want isn't necessarily what they actually need. Sometimes they, they want their, um, their dad alive. They want their dad to come back to life. But what they really need is just to know that they have love from their family. That's true. So I see because at the end of the day, you might get what you want, but because it's not what you actually needed, you don't grow as much you don't develop as well I suppose so it would be more like yeah you got what you supposedly wanted but was it really what you needed to either grow move on become a better person etc we see this the best in stories that show that the character wants money they want to be rich and if they don't get it but they see that they um, what they actually need is to be with their family, then that's a semi-sweet ending. You know, they don't get everything they want. They don't become rich and get the love of their family. They choose the love of their family because they realize that's what they really need. And so they, in the, in, they didn't get what they want, which was to be rich, so but they did the get thing, what they right? need. Here's the thing. I feel like it would be more semi-sweet to get what you need instead of what you want. That is what that is. Oh, but that's what I read, and you said it was semi-sweet. They fail to achieve what they want, but achieve what they need. So they get what they need, but not what they want. That's semi-sweet. Oh, okay. Yeah. What's it? Uh, <laughs> Go ahead, Nish. 
what's the popular song of rolling stone right rolling stones uh, you don't always get what you want <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's you get me <laughs> all right so we have sweet top left we have semi-sweet top right now we have a character they get what they want but they don't get what they need okay that would be bittersweet right yeah that's bittersweet and that's because again maybe they wanted money but they didn't realize that what they really needed was the love of their family so they ended up they ended up being rich but they lost their family in the process. No, 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 your, their family is your solution to everything. Death, I'm death, using the same story. No, no. <laughs> death and love and money. That's all I, That's all there is to this. No, they say kidding. like, oh, they get rich, but they're not necessarily happy. Exactly. Because the, their family left. My, I'm using the same, I'm using the same yeah, story, yeah, so it's yeah. comparable. What is that? Money can't buy you happiness. <laughs> I mean, he buys a new wife. <laughs> what if his family says, ever after. You didn't need money. Yeah, yeah. I needed money, but I also didn't need the love of my family either because my family sucks. So I need something else. I'm going to use the same story point for, for everything, right? So, all right, if we said sweet ending, they got rich, but they also had their family with them to support them. There you go. Best ending ever. But they get um, in the semi sweet ending, they um, don't get the money, but they realize that all they really needed was their family. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I agree. The, um, bittersweet ending, they get the money, but they lose their family in the process. The family oh. goes, you know what? We're not sticking around. You're becoming something we don't want to be a part of. You're oh. you know, obsessed with this thing. Bye. Mm -hmm. Last ending. It's the only one we have left. It's the where the character doesn't get what they want or what they need. Oh. No, that's good. <laughs> 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 I don't want to react to that. I'm, I'm, like, oh. I'm, I'm not even. Oh, oh that's sad. I'm sad. <laughs> <laughs> <Why not? laughs> All right, which ending would that be? It's the only one we have left. Don't don't worry, be happy. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> Bitter. So the bitter ending is uh, using the same scenario. They go for money. The family leaves them. And um, they end up poor and lonely. They don't poor end up getting what they, they get fired or whatever. So they don't get money or the family. And so then they're just, they, they tried for something that they thought they needed, but really it was just something they wanted and they didn't end up getting it. So they didn't get anything. Not and what they wanted. Broken alone. Yeah. And so those are the four main endings that Studio Binder says you can give a character. And of course, for. there's that character arc that builds to one of these things, especially if it's a TV show and you have a longer arc. It's going to depend on which ending you end up going with. It's kind of gradually heading to those directions. Mm. Yeah, this, is, uh, this is probably the most important part of storytelling or story uh, script writing is that uh, the need and the want is usually very confusing when you're actually writing the character, uh, you know, when you're uh, writing the story based on some characters. And uh, sometimes, even, uh, and that's, that's because that even as human beings, the wants and needs are often very uh, often confused. Yeah. yeah. What you yeah. think you need is usually with just what you want. Right. So you don't, you know, sometimes like uh, in life cycle, uh, people, I mean, generally it's very confusing to understand what the need is and what the want is, and one gets confused with the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially and, because it takes a lot of introspection right. to figure out what you actually need. And even then. Well, it's also that it's really important to do a character analysis on your own script. Yeah. So you can figure and out. And that's hard too, because it can, like when you become personal with the character, or if you relate to the character, it can be very hard for you to distance yourself and see, okay, what does this character actually need? That's why it's very frowned upon, at least I know in the writing world, I'm, I'm not exactly sure about like films, but I, I know in the writing world, it's very frowned upon when you, self-insert yourself and you basically write a character that's you and yeah it should draw from experiences but it shouldn't be necessarily you exactly and so when that happens 
in a work of literary fiction, it a, a lot of people don't like it. A lot of people can tell because when they read it, they they read very much a lack of self awareness. They read very much an either. We're talking about films. Here. I know, I know, but I'm saying that <laughs> I'm just using that as a comparison. That I think it can happen when writing a script too. If you try too hard to write a character that is way too similar to yourself or way too similar um, to someone you know and you don't have that introspection, it can come off very pretentious or not lack of self-awareness or just like the character isn't that fleshed out or deep. Yeah, so I agree with what Vish said. This is extremely important for a film, if you can really understand your characters and you can understand what they want, but also what they need, and you decide, you know, where that's going as you're writing, or you decide beforehand, however you write, whatever your writing style is, knowing your characters inside and out, inside being what they need, outside being what they want. Um, and they're just, you know, their personality, their twerk, their quirks and everything like that. Uh, it'll just help you to write a lot better stories and a lot better characters in those moments and how they'd actually react. Because in the end, what are they actually going for? What, what's the reason? Then you have the characters interacting with each other and you can start to break down. What are they trying to get out of this situation? What does each of them want? And um, what are they going to try to do to get that? And are they going to sacrifice what they really need to get what they want mm -hmm. or not? You know, and those kinds of things. Yeah, does anyone else have anything to add to that? I think I had it in that. All right, so the last thing we're gonna talk about um, is just gonna be like, what, what was everyone's favorite things from this semester that they learned? For me, I really liked learning about the color theory stuff. I also really liked, um, I really liked learning about the showrunners and that kind of thing. because I was always confused on how a TV director was different from a film director. And now I like really understand the TV directors, you know, they don't have as much say at all as a film director. So that's why it's kind of looked at as a different job because it kind of basically is it just has the same title. Um, whereas the showrunner is kind of the one calling all the shots on the shows, the director's calling most of the shots creatively on the films. Um, and yeah, and I think just like this distribution in general, I feel like I learned a lot of this stuff of like uh, I'm less afraid of it because I know more about it now, even though it's still a huge daunting thing. It's like I know what needs to be done now to get a film and distribution and what process it goes through so that I have a better way to look out for myself if I am signing any contracts and know what rights I can give away and making sure I'm not just going to sign a bad deal because I don't know what I'm doing. But yeah, if anyone else wants to add what their favorite part so far has been. I think, uh, you know, uh, you mentioned uh, quite a few uh, and definitely all of them and uh, distribution was a uh, uh, big thing in there. Uh, what I also liked was uh, the color theory and the production uh, part of it, where, uh, you know, the exercises that we did uh, to uh, do a hands-on thing uh, and applying the color theory to that uh, was definitely very helpful. And, uh, and you know, in general, I think um, learning or, uh, you know, uh, seeing other uh, other uh, members and you know, other colleagues kind of doing uh, their their part uh, in the production process uh, you know had different perspective of how things uh, were taken differently by different people yeah it's crazy how differently it's taken by everybody for real yeah. <laughs> like uh, how different everybody, everybody comes up with stuff it's crazy it's, it's really cool Everybody was doing the same thing, but uh, their you know approach and their perspective was completely different, which was very yeah. nice. Yeah. Unique exactly. in a lot of it was really cool, especially because and we've been talking about this for a really long time about how unique everyone's mind is and how you can give people the same idea 
in the same project and they can come up with completely different things. And we saw that with, with these projects this semester and that was really cool. And that's the reason there's a, there's a reason there's the mood boards and there's a reason there's all these things so that they can, cause language, even though you feel like you're being clear, somebody's gonna think of something completely different from what you're talking about and what you had envisioned in your head. So the better you can illustrate it to them, the better you can come across to everybody to get the same on the same page and know what we're actually, you know, what we're going for in this that's production. The part, that's the part I, that I enjoyed about the course is that I was at first a little daunted, like, you know, how do you bring everything together? Mm -hmm. And just to have that title, but looking like going through the course, it's like, it, just, it has to be that way. You know, that's what I learned. Like, you know, all of these, you know, the different, I was like, literally I was daunted by the, the different type of positions. Like, you know, you have this person that handles this, this person that handles this. Now I look at it like, that's the only way. So it's kind of, it's humbling at the same time, you know, to, 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 to all of a sudden be like, yeah, I can do that, yeah. you know, because this this has to be done. Right, yeah, and so, like, the more crew members you have, there's a reason why there's, like, hundreds of people on a set really with the sense. biggest budgets, but mm -hmm. on the smaller budgets, you just got to take over those roles and do it and run and gun it and figure it out because you don't have the budget for the hundreds of people, so, yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, and just and just putting it out there too. Like I remember you saying that too, and uh, Priscilla as well. Just you know, like doing just putting it, you know, like just the just our forum. You know, like sometimes you may be wrong, you know, and, and you know you're hesitant to say something, but now when it's the forum, it's like everybody, you know, it's, it's, you're not really wrong, you know, when it's like a forum, it's like opinions. Mm -hmm. yeah and you know and that was my issue at first you know like contributing you know like my ideas and you know like my ideas are different because i have i'm just you know <laughs> i'm just changing into this you know and i you know my my vocabulary is different so it's really interesting you know like how you can just you can, how everybody can you know find their way in in this 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 project that you gave that you, yeah. Um, at yeah and that's why I like uh, like you just said like that's why it's so important to like that's why like whenever you have a director and you have a production designer and you have all these people that are trying to um execute the director's vision there's a reason they got to meet so many times to talk and discuss it and well check this is this what you're going for oh no i mean i mean because the language is so different and like what you someone says the way they talk the way they say things and stuff they're talking about it's all going to be very different from person to person so it's very important to cut continually meet and like illustrate those things as best as possible like you're saying and i feel like um yeah like with the exercises this semester it was really cool because it felt like some of the ideas that I had, um, one of the main ideas I had for like the feature film later on, I started like making the mood board for it and stuff. And it felt like it was becoming real because it was stuff. Now I'm thinking about it. I'm looking at it and seeing like what could be done here and there and how could we do this? And so, yeah, I feel like the more stuff you do for the actual project, even if you're just in pre-production, yeah. the more it starts to feel real and the more it feels like you can actually get it done. Yeah, I enjoyed um, learning about, of course, you know, di uh, the digital cinema packages, um, because it's actually like, you know, an area where I'm starting to transition to, you know, so just, you know, the timing couldn't be any more perfect. Um, because, you know, you know, as I progress in my film career, these are things that like, at some point, you know, it's good to, to have a grasp of understanding of like what comes next. You know, every the whole th the one thing it's you know you have an idea, then you write the script and you do like a short little film. But as you progress, the films and the projects get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, which also it kind of cues me that I'm going to, in going into the right direction now that I'm getting there. Not 
saying it's Hollywood or anything, but it's just, you know, um, just learning about that aspect of of cinema is, was, I thought that was pretty cool. And then, um, of course, the miniature, well, the exercise, you know, I had fun with the miniature exercise. <laughs> Yeah. Learning was cool too because I never really um, thought about. I never because you know I always saw you know you see it in movies and then like you know you always think oh you always just automatically assume that it's a um, a set. Well, not even a, a set. And then there's uh, the CGI. Like I'm oh, always yeah. I'm, 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 I'm just, just yeah. You always assume it's probably so far out of my league. Of my reach, there's probably a bunch of CGI in this. Like, especially with Lord of the Rings, when they did those camera movements, I always just assumed it was you know, a digital camera in a 3D, uh, a 3D space, just going around doing whatever it wants. Well, Not yeah. Like you know, I, I knew about miniatures from like, but I always I always thought that because, I, you know, Ghostbusters was like one of the first ones, you know, to, to, to pop that off. But like, I always thought like that was like an older, old, thing i didn't know like it would it could still be you know modernized and up to date the way it was with like lord of the rings and and stuff like because you know I, I didn't pay any attention to the behind the scenes for that but um, <laughs> yeah like it just kind of like gave me a, another look on you know just on, the, on that type of thing so I, I always just oh because you, know, you know i don't know i guess we kind of just as like ascended past it like as soon as cgi came out we automatically assumed that everything was cgi when that that really wasn't the case, you know. Yeah. Um, so that that was cool too. And back to the cinema digital cinema package thing too. Um, yeah, the fact that it's a device that um, replace it's in the digital, so it's it's a device. Because I always want, I always kind of wondered. I was like, well, if they're not using film anymore, you know, I always thought like maybe like how are they? Um, what media device are they using? So that kind of answered that question as well. I always wondered like because if they don't have the, the the film strips anymore like mm -hmm. how are they actually presenting the movie and that that answered my question too so i i never you know considered that like a digital cinema pack a device that's you know i always thought like it was like hooked up to a computer i mean it kind of is but you know you know what i'm saying like yeah so this digital cinema package replaces the um the can film um to kind of give that aspect of it for people who don't uh didn't make the connection so like they're not doing it's now digital it's digitized film in a way it's replacing the can yeah even when they shoot on film they actually digitize it later so that it can be shown in all theaters because theaters don't even have those old well some might but a lot of theaters don't have those old film projectors anymore where it actually sucks in the film and sh sh displays it on the screen yeah 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 but yeah like this you know, these meetings, are, you know, I mean, when we first started out, it was kind of slow because, you know, I had already done a lot of stuff. But now, like, we're at a point now where it's like, OK, this is, you know, this is pretty informative, informative yeah. stuff. That's awesome. Yeah, you yeah. Know, I'm glad you uh, stuck around, too. Yeah, we were, you know, finding our footing. We had plenty of people that were like, well, I already know all this. <laughs> yeah. But I also appreciate that you brought a lot of knowledge to it, too, and that was really fun because... I feel like everyone has like some experience they can bring, some uh, whether it's life experience or experience in the field, experience from just like learning and, and we're just like people you know or things you've seen. Yeah, and I feel like that's really cool, and yeah. uh, it's going to be really fun looking back on these soon. It's, it's not over yet. Did you say what your favorite was, Priscilla? No, yeah, there's another one. Um, honestly, from this semester, I feel like my favorite part was learning, like um, like Brian was saying, about the different, like the CGI and the practical effects. That is so much fun. That was so much fun to learn about. It was upsetting in some parts, like a little infuriating, but um, it was just so cool to see how much detail, how much creativity, how much craftsmanship goes into it. And it's... It's, it's so cool to see when movies implement that and don't just take the easy way out or don't just try to like do the cheapest fix thing. Fix everything in post. Yeah, fix everything in post, yeah, pretty much. And actually planning it out, it's pretty nice. <laughs> I just really enjoy that, seeing that there's still so much passion 
and creativity in film, especially in this decade that we've been going through that's been not the best for film, let's be honest. It's been a bit of a dud decade. You're talking about from 2020? Or are you talking about all the way from 2010? That's true. Dead <laughs> few decades. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like there have been good movies. They Lately, Hollywood has just felt a little more lazy. And it's, it's always fun to see passionate people doing what they love and doing it well. All right, cool. All right, so last thing I'm going to say is um, that, you know, we have one more meeting for this semester. Um, oh, I don't think I, what are the, we have one more meeting for this semester. We still have one more semester to go. Um, Thursday will be our last meeting for the semester, and then we don't start our next semester until, uh, let me make sure I get the date right. September 6th, because there's Labor Day on September 5th. So it'll be Tuesday, September 6th that we start our next semester. Next semester, we're talking, I'll go more in detail about the overview of what we're studying on Thursday. Um, Thursday, we're going to have a quiz. So it's gonna be like more questions like this. It's just not gonna be the visual ones. It's just gonna be, um, you know, questions about what we've learned throughout the semester, have some more of like a refresh um, and, and then yeah, we'll just talk about like what what the uh, what next semester holds, um, and then take those three weeks off. So appreciate everybody coming. Thanks for sharing like what your favorite parts were. I like hearing everybody's different um, opinions on what their favorite thing was. Oh, and thanks oh, for sorry. Oh, what? We, we had a, so just because we've gone over drones too. So I just told y'all before we started that I got a drone. So I got this, this one was used. Where can for, you fly it by the way? Cause like DC is pretty. I think DC at like, so this drone, so I, I'm not sure if you guys covered, um, there's, there's a weight limit or restriction. So this, this is the, the Maverick mini, which is like 2.5. It's like under a pound. So Isn't there's still know, like no flight zones though? There is in some areas. So like there like you, you download the software and it pretty much tells you where you can and cannot fly. Oh um, nice. That's cool. Yeah. Do you have the proper permit and everything already? No, not for the minute. You don't need it for the weight limit that he has. Oh, okay. So it's only at a specific weight that you because then it becomes more dangerous and it becomes like a more of a hazard. So they make sure oh, you have like okay. so these things like they are trying to but they they're becoming more and more. So I I just got this one. This one was a hundred and no, yep, yeah, hundred and fifty bucks. But then after taxes, it was like hundred and sixty two or something like that. Um, so yeah, they're getting. But this one was used, but it's like brand new. Like I just got it up and running today. The software, it's a lot more simple to. Well, I'm, it's, it was a headache, but once you get it up, it's it's, it's pretty cool. So just giving you that bit of information um because like and then it's the gimbal on it too so i'm i don't know nice yeah very much a stabilized nice footage from the sky you get crane looking shots and different types of shots with drones that are really nice looking yeah you know how to fly. And it's kind of i don't know i think it's kind of cool to fly them too because it's kind of like a remote controlled airplane or helicopter yeah i mean when we talk it's basically a grown up toy Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a kind of like when we talked about it, we talked to you guys talking, we went over like um, maybe getting a cheaper one, learning how to fly that one. But this one, like, because I, I had mentioned that too, like I have a little toy one, little toy helicopters where I can learn how to fly it. But this, <laughs> oh, man, it just, the controls are so much nicer. So it does, it does matter. Um, the nicest of it. But originally this thing goes for about 400 bucks, but you can get it used for 250. Would it be... Nice. Probably not. I was just thinking, like, I'm sure people have tried it, right? Getting a GoPro and putting it on a helicopter, like a flying helicopter toy, and then just... They usually can't handle the weight of it. Yeah. You can actually put a Go... Yeah, GoPros. But the GoPros are, like, super light, depending on the... Yeah, but a helicopter that's made to hold the toy uh, is going right, to be, like, yeah, super... Like those plastic, really thin ones. Yeah, but there are bigger ones you actually can do that with. And I think the bigger drones you can actually do that with, right? You can like yeah, that, take off the camera that it comes with and attach whatever you want. Yeah, that's originally how it's going to go up. It's like DPI and GoPro. Like, you got this GoPro and it goes on there. But now, you know, DPI, they kind of like, so they don't 
gimbals now, and now they have their own like drone with their own little camera sensor on there and all that stuff. So, but actually, the the gimbal on this thing is oh my gosh, it's, it's amazing. Like, I'm thinking about using this for a steady, for like a steady cam. I'm like gonna put it on a a boom. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, it's that's it's, the independent thinking right there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so you guys is not dead. Or even yeah. even you ready for problem solve stuff. If you if you need some shots, you could probably just buy one and get some drone shots with it. Just putting that out there, for people yeah. to know. Yeah, but, that's awesome. yeah, that's your yeah. rights. <laughs> information. Excited about this. I don't know. It's like Christmas to me right now. No, yeah, that's awesome. And I'm sure it opens up a whole world of opportunities for you and your work too. Oh yeah, yeah, because yeah, not, not as many people know about that. So the more specialized you can get, different skill sets, definitely. It definitely does. Uh, on Friday, I was shooting a music video with a buddy of mine, and he, you know, because I'm I have a, you know, we kind of tag team. Like he has this equipment, I have that equipment. So he brought me over because I have a jib. And it was like, yo, bring it over. And we were hanging, you know, but the house we were shooting in, it was like a million dollar. It was a mansion. The place was huge. So it was like, a, you know, it was like a rap music video, you know, it was like the party scene. Like that. Yeah. And jib hanging over like the, on the second, like just this big opening, the big ledge. So we had the jib hanging over everybody. And I was like, yo, this would have been perfect if I had my drone like right now. Like we could have just wow. had so doing all this work to, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but I don't know. But it would have right. been so much more simpler. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, cool. Thanks for the information. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I'll see everybody on Thursday and we'll do the quiz. It's going to be similar to how this was, except for we're just going to go name by name, ask a question. So it's going to be, right. everyone will be ready. Yeah, it's not like they don't have to know everything. It's just more for refreshing and everything for everybody. It's to make it more fun and dynamic when it when we're learning all this stuff, you know? Yeah, no, it's fun. It's fun. All right, guys. Have a good night. All right. All right. Good night. Mm-hmm.